One, two, three. Welcome to Skilta. My name is Joe Austin, and thanks for joining us. Can I remain you that Skilta is a joint production of Fox Affairs to Hear and Feel and Fubble? And as we began Filter some time ago, we talked about interesting people and bringing them to your attention and allowing people to have a sense of who the person rather than the event is. And my guest this evening fits all of those criteria, and it's Lawrence McKeel. And thank, thank you. you. I know you hasted the whole way from South Therma <laughs> up to, to speak to yeah. us. It's very difficult sometimes when you're interviewing people who have had a full life to try and squeeze that full life into an hour. But by God, you've had a full life. And I, I, I want to kind of, if you wouldn't mind, take us through the various parts. We can't dwell in any of it because it's, it's just so, so long. I, I was doing a wee bit of research on you last night and, and I drifted into a quotation from our comrade, Mr. Kavanagh, the, 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 uh, the poet and, and the uh, author and the grump and the, all of that there. And he talked about rural people, people in a rural setting have a nearly a seventh or eighth sense. And he said that if you want to meet a fool in the country, bring one in from the city. <laughs> and growing up in Randallstown, <clears throat> was it a bit like that? Uh, it's always difficult to think back, <clears throat> because it, what are you comparing it with? I mean, I had a very, Probably long back, ideally, very simple. I mean, my I had an older sister, and younger brother. Uh, my father was a fan driver. Um, we lived right in a real rural part of a long lane. We were halfway up the lane. Um, very mixed area, so the background's a bit unusual from other people who I ended up meeting with in later years were specifically from an Iceland area. Wonderful neighbours, uh, Warwick's. I learned to drive a tractor on their farm, and uh, when, I was, when I was 10 years of age, and I, I, I loved it. And, um, and actually, I was thinking about it the other day, um, maybe when I was, I was thinking of the show, that it's one of those moments of where I can vividly remember it, and it was probably about, I was 10. And um, I was with David Warwick, who was the young guy, his, his father was called Davy. So we're picking up bales of hay, but I wasn't big enough to lift these bales of hay, so he was right. getting on the tractor driving, stopping, getting out, and lifting them on. And he said to me, hey, jump on a driver. And I was like, you, you serious? You know? And cause I'd been watching them and all, you know, what, what they'd done. So, I did, and it didn't get off to the smoothest of start, I think, but, uh, but by the end of the evening I'd, I'd, I'd mastered it, but it always stood out as it was an adult having trust in you, and believing you could do something, and that always, now he just, he, the handle was just handy, it saved him jumping on the tractor. So it was a fairly, maybe lived in a house, like probably most people at the time, you had no electricity, no running water, no indoor sanitation, but everybody was poor, so you didn't think somebody else has, you know, that, the guys at the end of the lane had the phone, the Millers. Um, one of the other houses had the TV where me and my brother used to go down and watch the TV with Sammy Todd, who was a, he worked on the railway pulling the, the, the gates and, the, and the, the levers for the thing. We lived at Cookstown Junction, uh, where it used to be at the, the railway either went to Port Roche or went off to Cookstown and that had been long abandoned. So, I mean, it's, hard, it's hard to say uh, what, what, what you were saying there. Um, to me, it was just my, life there and fairly idyllic and then you know, come um, around 69 the M2 motorway was being built. Yeah. Now why anybody built a motorway to Randallstown because Randallstown's a village <laughs> except that Lord O'Neill's <coughs> castle is beside it so yeah. maybe he wanted a quick way to Belfast. Perhaps. But also at the time they were developing Antrim as a town the same as Craig Oven. So I went straight through our house and, 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 we, and we had to get out and, and move down the road and again interesting how you're living through the fence and not really uh, aware of the significance of them, but my father was a very, I don't say in any um, disrespect man, but meek man, like he wanted to yeah. respect authority and all of that there. Had to move house, so I had to get somewhere for his, for his family, and uh, a friend of his, Billy Burns, a Protestant guy who drove, drove a lorry as well, had built a bungalow a few years previously. So my father said, would you give us the plans and we'll see if I'm a pen for them, and, and all that. Billy just credit and out of our house said, yeah, not a problem here. And put them forward onto the council, and they're not back. Now, the whole civil rights thing was around an end of discrimination, housing, employment, and probably the only time my father ever resorted to like legal action was to get a lawyer to point out to the council that the same council, more or less the exact same members, yeah. had passed the exact same plans three years earlier, and the house was there in existence. So there was a bit of a face saving exercise done, and a wall was moved. But you're living through these things, not realise that, and actually as we were building the house. The Civil Rights March, the People's Democracy March, yeah, uh, yeah. in January was coming the through. March. Yep, yeah. they could stop the Antrim, 
and they were bussed the minibuses down to the small Hibernian Hall, 172A of Hibernian Hall, they sat in the same field as, as we were building the house. And I just remember these, I mean, I was 12 at the time, and uh, these cars arriving with people with long hair and, uh, and, and such like, and not been aware of what it was. And then the next day, hearing it, one of our neighbours drove into them in Randallstown, who were the Millers, who were a very different breed from the others that we knew. Yeah. The so you're actually living through historic times and not been, been aware of it. So it was probably an end of innocence then, probably from about 12 to 13 on, because we got TV and all the rest of it, you could watch the debates. And I mentioned the Patrick Cavanagh quotation there, and, and I actually think it's a very, it's a very uh, apt quotation. Uh, when you meet people from a rural setting, like you're driving a tractor when you're 10, you know. In Belfast, people at 10 were trying to get around a three-wheeler bike right, with right, a yeah, yeah, tractor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the civil rights kind of momentum it developed. Actually, I think that, <clears throat> to a large extent, a, a forgotten fact, the first civil rights, or the meeting to organise the first civil rights association was actually held in South Derry. It was held in Kevin Agnews, no, who's yeah, the man who yeah, yeah, you yeah, would know yeah. off if you didn't actually know him. 17, you, you find yourself arrested. Um, shock for you, obviously, but a shock for your family. Well, it was, well, yeah, shock at that time, but I actually ended up, uh, I was a resident, I was 19, almost 20, but I left home when I was 17 and a half on the run. So it was the big shock for me, I left one night when I thought, um, well, I was going to get raided or, or, or my name has been bandied about as, 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 as being involved. Um, so that was a, a big shock to the time and ended up meeting my mother down in Monaghan three weeks later and then I was up and forward to the north and then you're in that period of extended ceasefire off the fatal talks in, in mm. 74 and the 75 and then again I'm out of my house and all the rest would, shouldn't have been there on that night in August 76 but yes, uh, yeah, very big shock uh, I and mean, I didn't come from a Republican family and I suppose for me most of the people I met later in jail didn't come from Republican families. I don't think in this general Republicans wasn't this big vibrant yeah, thing. Yeah, of course. Maybe, I mean, you would have known certain families and all the rest of it. Uh, it was a, a new generation responding to the situation. Um, so yeah, it's a big shock for them, and then and probably radicalised. Uh, certainly, my mother to some degree. I think my father always had real difficulties with it. Yeah. Um, and again, I've thought of that more in recent years as a father, not of, not of sons, of daughters. But how, um, how it must have been a challenge to fathers, their sons becoming <coughs> no active in something, and they're only 17, 18 years of age, and it's almost, it's not a rebellion against the father, the society. Yeah. You know? Stranger, you should say that. One of the questions I was going to try and trip you up with was are you, you growing know, are you growing into your father uh, I had spoken to someone last night and was trying to get a feel of you growing up during that period and they described you as a young 17 year old not a 17 year old of this generation they said you were well mannered and, and quiet the two characteristics I recognize uh, you're, you're still well mannered and you're still a quiet person but is it fair to say and you mentioned that dilemma that your father faced and, and all fathers some, some stage in their life mm -hmm. faced. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> it must have been a, a, a fairly big decision as a 17 year old to take, to take upon yourself to become involved in a, an uprising uh, from a background that wasn't all of that politics. Did you take yeah. it lately? No, no, no. Um. And it was difficult to come in for my area wasn't a Republican area, so he didn't know IRA people. I think it was the process, Joe, of, uh, as I said, we moved to a new house. We had access to electricity and indoor sanitation and TV, and now you were seeing all the debates. And my father would have watched Brenda Devlin and have been Jerry Fitton, who was dirty today, not even John Hume, um, and been really animated, even though I said he wasn't, he never would have discussed politics out of the house. And again, what I realised, and again, this is later years, you realise is he was hearing for the first time on TV, which would be a powerful thing, you know, that yeah, someone yeah. said on TV. Um, things that he knew had happened to him, he was a second class citizen in his own, his own country, you know. And I do think it's that thing, a bit maybe a father in the house and, uh, you know, the father, and, and different today also, more patriarchal in those days and more owners on the thought he used to tend, you know, fend for the family and all the rest of it. So the fact that 
the sun in the 17s, um, you know, looking in a different way and saying, no, you know, you know, keeping the heads down, you know, it's time to, it's time to get off the feet. I've often wondered, did he feel it's almost like a slight on him and his generation uh, for it? Um, in later years, before he died, we ended up uh, with, a, with, a, with a good relationship, and I think that was just probably both of us, both of us growing up. Um, but I'm sure it was, it was difficult for him at that time that it's like things happening around you that he doesn't understand. So as for me, it was a thing of become more interested in the debates that I was hearing. And then people who you were at school with who were only a few years older been arrested or interned mm. and, and whatever, uh, made me more and more interested. And um, I'm still not sure how I, how I ended up being approached. I think what happened was I was uh, at a dance one night in Arbo and said to a guy I went to school with who lived around Tomb Bridge, what I was thinking of doing, mm. a couple of drinks. It was 15 or 16 <laughs> and, uh, and I think what happened was, that what I realised later was he was involved with the Fianna, I didn't know at the time, but I thought if, if he knew anybody would so several months later I was approached and, uh, and someone said to me that they'd orchestrated a situation, I was in the car with them on their own and they said I hear you're looking to join the, the RA. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, nor a few months went by before I did meet two people who weren't that much older than me and one of them was a woman. And uh, I suppose that surprised me too, that this yeah. man was a senior member of, of, the, of the IRA. And basically what they were saying to me was, look, you're going to end up in jail or dead. And or you, you ended up really both? Well, yeah, 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 I did, you know. Uh, so yeah, it was a big decision. I mean, if I was looking at two decisions that really influenced the course of my life, it was joining the IRA and then probably joining the hunger strike. I, I want to speak about those, but I, I'm interested in teasing out the young Lawrence before we get mm -hmm. to... Mm -hmm. We get to the prison part of it, which was which played such a big part in your life, and in the life of the community we both come from. And and you mentioned the dilemma of a father, <clears throat> and you mentioned in later years your father and you. Not that you were ever estranged, but you kind of came to a relationship, a better relationship, or a better place. And this is another comment that someone someone made, and and it could be a million maids off the mark. Do you do you find your you've two guards, haven't you? Mm. Do you find yourself growing into your father? Um, I suppose I'm aware now of, of parental responsibility. Uh, I don't think I'm really going into my father because he was very different. I mean, I suppose my estrangement actually began when I was 11 because I went to a very small country primary school, two classrooms. So you had primary five, six, seven and one and one, two, three, four and the other. And uh, my teacher was Mrs. McEwen, who was the mother of Donald McEwen, the bishop. Mm -hmm. right, no? Yeah. Uh, and anyway, I passed my 11 plus, and I'd always wanted to go to Antrim Technical. It was always, always like working with my hands, and I still do, and working with wood and, and, and such like and DIY and all of that. Um, but that year, they stopped taking people in from primary. You had to go to a secondary school before you could go to the technical college. So uh, Mrs. McEwen, Rose McEwen, she suggested to my family that uh, they get me in the St. Malachy's in Belfast. So I did. And I hated it with a passion. Um, I mean, I got about half six in the morning to cycle on a bike, a couple of miles to get a bus to go twenty miles to Belfast to be there at nine. But that was also for something about the formality, and, and maybe it was just it was sort of overpowering going from this small country school into this huge, yeah, formal formal setting. And I started to Mitch, and uh, like I never been in Belfast, and I just started hanging about Smithfield. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at so porn magazines and, and all the other sort of <laughs> things right on the Central Library. Yeah. For about three weeks until they sent a letter and said, uh, This boy's not at school. Not at school. And my, my father was absolutely raging. And probably because I mean, he left school when he was about 13, 14 to work on a, on a coal lorry. Mm. You know, so it was, it was almost like you've thrown up this opportunity. Yeah, and you just yeah. throw it up in the face and, and then it comes again the next minute you're in the IRA and then the next minute you're in jail. So it's just always that sort of, so it's a very different way of seeing the world. Uh, and what I really regret is that later on, I mean, I did go on and do education, did a PhD and all the rest, and I would love to have to have been alive to see that you can pursue struggle and you can pursue educational qualifications. And they're not mutually and, exclusive. No, no, no. You talked about that, that and I'm interested in that, that kind of impersonal society around any big school, but it happens to be some Malachi's that you find. You end up in jail. 
1975, I think. 76, 76 August 70, 76, yeah. which is the arrest special uh, year. No, so, August 76. Yeah. How did you manage jail? I mean, because you are a private person, you are a quiet person, you are, and you and you, you mentioned you, you went on. I like the way you said that in passing. I got a PhD, but I don't read it. Well, just just in case you don't get back to it. Oh, the I will get back to it. Believe you me. The PhD is called Unrepentant Fenian Bastard. I so understand that, that. <laughs> but we will get back to it. I, I'll, yeah, make, yeah, I'll no promise problem. you that. <clears throat> but you know, apart from the struggle in jail, the human kind of contact that 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 explosion of people of ideas of, of resistance of all of that. Was it a comfort that grouping, or, or was it was it a hardship? Um, no, you're right that I like. Uh, I mean, I like my own company, and I like all our company, and and, and, a, and a balance between the two of them. And I suppose maybe the irony was going on in '76 was the start of criminalisation, so we're all in single cells. Okay, you had it cellmates with you. I've always been lucky enough that the people that I shared a cell with, or maybe it's because I was fairly flexible and all the rest of it, but generally. Um, there were people that you could easily get on with. Um, I think I took it okay. There was a lot of people already in the jail from South Derry that I knew. Um, vaguely, it was the year Kieran Nugent was in our wing. Um, if, looking back on it, just extremely naive. Like this idea of criminalisation and what lies ahead was yeah. just um, like I remember the day. It was a Sunday, and '76 was a lovely, lovely summer. And we were in the yard. Bar Barney McReynolds from the market was the uh, the OC. Kieran Nugent was due to get sentenced the next week, and he just called a meeting. People stopped the football cover. Um, Kieran's been sentenced next week. Uh, the policy says we don't wear the prison uniform or do prison work. Okay, yeah, okay. Back to football. Back to football. Then. Back to if it's as some of us that were hearing that the heat blocks are sinking and all the rest, and it's just confirmed. You know, yes, a mad policy. That the Brits have thought of just to you know disappear and, and probably even an eagerness to get sentenced to go down to you know, experience the blanket because this was going to be a short lived thing. And it would be great to say you're on the blanket, like, and, and it wasn't going to last. It was a five year thing, as it I, turned out. I have interviewed, I've been very fortunate to have interviewed a number of people quite recently as well, the people who had been on the blanket, men and women, uh, and they talk about being swept away by that sense of resistance that it, it was the all prevailing thing that that you weren't going to be broken you mentioned Kieran Nugent who unfortunately isn't with us yeah, anymore yeah, yeah. but you, you mentioned all, all of that 70 days on hunger strike you you, you, all, you have a great quotation I don't know why you ever revisit it you talk about slipping into death I, I don't know how much thought went into that phrase, but that phrase when it said slipping into death, even when my bald head makes the hers in the back of my <laughs> neck. You were very young, this was all going on around you, you had joined the hunger strike, knowing at that stage, if, if there was ever any doubt about the consequence of the hunger strike, if there was ever, and I doubt that there was, of the second hunger strike, at that stage you knew that the, the very strong possibility was that you were going to die. How, what age were you? I was 24. How do you deal with it? How does a 24 year old deal with the fact you're going to die? Um, well, I suppose the thing is, wars are fought by young people, and, and by, by that stage, um, and I've often said you couldn't have had uh, people going to prison, myself included, and holding a hunger strike the first year and 10 people down wasn't going to happen. It was that five years of living in uh, intense, extreme conditions, um, but also in an extreme bond of, of solidarity. Um, which I think people probably again weren't aware of until, until afterwards. There's all these things you think back of it. It's just yeah. this solid bunch. It doesn't matter who you were. I mean, I've described that the blank has been a great leveller. It doesn't matter who you were outside, where you lived, what you were sentenced for, whatever else, as long as you were there at the end of the day and, and there the next morning. So it was this great leveller brought everybody together. No hierarchy. And so all of those things factored in until, I think, whenever it came to Hunger Street because you were aware that you were part of this greater group and they're dependent on you as well and not in the sense you then feel oh god I have to do this but you feel that you, you want to be engaged in it and then you I mean I suppose what I'll try to explain to people is whenever you come to 
close to the end of a long hunger strike, you're just so exhausted, and it's not just physically, it's yeah. mentally and emotionally, because everybody who died wanted to live. So everything's a battle to stay alive as long as possible, until it comes to a point where you realise, that's, that's, that's not for me, I'm, I'm, I'm going here. But you're so exhausted. And like I remember like almost having like a dream, like you're, you know, you're falling unconscious and you have to wake up, you have to wake up. And I obviously was already in a level of unconsciousness, so it's almost like this constant thing of trying to, until it comes to a point where then it's, well, as I said, yeah, you're, you're slipping into there. So it's not, you no know, people say we're really afraid and all that. Like, it's not even, it's not like you're looking for it as release or relief because it wasn't like a suicidal thing, but it's almost exhaustion to the point of, it's just, and, and acceptance probably is the best way to say it. It's just accept this is what's happening. So. That, 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 sense of, I can only call it extreme solidarity. I mean, you know, the quotation about no greater love is a man than to lay down his life, and, and by that I mean person, to lay down their lives. But you're not a religious person that I am aware of. Was there something that you, is there something that facing sir? I don't think the, the, the equation, equating uh, war and hunger strikes really work. I think in war you take your chance and you're out and you, you're never going mm, to be the person that shot. Hunger strike, you that that's you, uh, I think, haven't never been on hunger strike. But was there was there a fifth gear? Was there was there did you call on? Was there something apart from the solidarity of others and the and the sense that like I need the last, even if it's another day, I need the last. And was there a religious sense that you call into play? Was there a was did you fall back on your politics? What what keeps you going? I think it's a mixture of all of those. I mean, and at that stage, I still would have had um, some religious belief, although that had been well challenged over the years with all of our debates during the, the, the time of the protests and like the liberation theology and all of that. But and I suppose the thing that actually surprised me was that the chaplains, uh, Father Turner and Father Murphy, never tried to you know, argue this is suicide or, or whatever else. But I think it was a combination of the length of time the protests going on, known loads of others involved in it, Real, realising also I'm, I'm not a criminal. Um, so the big political picture, but the other thing was, and I've often said this to people, regardless of, of, of the politics and its criminalisation, if they criminalise us, they criminalise the whole Republican movement, it's a battle with the actual guard at the door, the screw at the door, you know, and you're thinking like there's no way, like I was doing life sentence, more than half the prisoners are doing life, getting out life like dolly mixtures. Um, so the rest of my life I'm going to be Yes, sir. No, sir. Three bags full, sir. No way. Like, so, and part of that was like you know, people say, "Well, it's not something else." No, after five years, it was hunger strike or total capitulation. There was no, there was no third way. The first, then the first hunger strike had showed that there was nothing. And the regime was looking total conformity. So all of those factors together, I think, contribute to you, um, to your strength. I, I want to move you on. I want to move you on because we could dwell on this for, for forever and yes. ever and ever. And I would. And I would. I remember going to visit you, by the way. And you were very close to death then. Mm -hmm. You were a giant. You're big now, but you'd lost that much uh, weight and you were so long. Yeah. It was uh, it was shock, fear, and look at the size of this guy. And you were very young. But just moving it on, because I want to go back to that sense of the demon at the door. Uh, be they, be they, be they repressive police or be the prison warders who are hand-picked to be repressive in the jail. And I want to reflect on one of your plays. Hunger strikes over, demands have been got at a terrible price uh, and all of that. You're in jail, you're, you're beginning to kind of, or maybe I'm, I'm saying this and asking at the same time, you're starting to develop a, an ability to, to read extensively. Uh, and to scribble, to write. Was there, was there a realisation at that stage that whenever I get out, if I ever get out, uh, I'm going to be a writer? Um, I think the thing that really led to it was, um, I was very much involved in the prison education, uh, and that was both the academic and, and IRA prisoners education. I ended up in charge of it for, for a couple of years, which is when we started magazine and all. It was more a realisation, I mean, the hunger strike I've often said this, and it can sound cliched, you know, or like sort of flipping. It was the end of rebellion and the start of revolution. I always remember Ernie O'Malley, he wrote out a letter one time uh, around the post 1916 era 
Southern Irish have made good rebels, but poor revolutionaries. Mm-hmm. And and part of it was, yeah, throw it at us, we'll take it, yeah, we'll, we'll fight it back. And, and the blanket protest on Hunger Strike was that, that was now exhausted. There was no other physical protest that you were going to do or could do that was going to surpass the Hunger Strike and all that. So we were left in a position that in, in October 1981 of where do we go from here? And it was a lot of soul search and all that. Shit. Um, but like the old Irish saying, like and and, and Dylan like, well, not Kakashi of a click person who isn't strong has to be clever. And I think then, first of all, we realised we're never going to get locked back up in cells again. Um, and we didn't even realise the strength that we had when we got out. I remember a, a security governor in later years, remember first name terms, and all come down the wing one day and he says, Lawrence, you know the mistake was we never thought what we're going to do once you come out from behind the end doors. And I could have said, we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we didn't <laughs> think before, either. But I didn't. But we didn't. And, was that, and that, was, that was an important revolution in later years of the strength we had amongst ourselves, a disciplined group of people who have this amazing solidarity. No prison regime could, could withstand it. You know, now we didn't totally know at the time, but as we seen, mass escape. So it, it, there was a there was a growing confidence about things, and then and there was a whole change in structures and and and, and all the rest of it. But I suppose we developed out of um, various processes with our poetry workshops and this creativity that was there. But part of uh, my fit at the time was we need to write our own history. I mean, even people who are sympathetic aren't going to fully get it. So if we can write, if we can do things, well, why not? We, we have the talents, the same as the IRA had its talents on the outside to make its own mortars and everything. Like we have a self-sufficiency in terms of telling our own history. So why, why would we allow, not, not allow, but leave it to others? So I became more interested in that thing of writing our own history. And that's where the likes of Normically Sir My Time came from and, and, and the Captive Voice magazine. Brian Campbell and yourself, the late Brian Campbell and yourself formed a kind of a, a partnership almost. But I want to ask you a question, just put something into my head, and I want it related to one of your plays. Um, there must be, to go through all of the brutality of the blacks, and to go through all of the brutality and the harshness of the hunger strike and the determination, it can't be driven by the hatred of the monster at the door. It has to be, there must be, it must be an equal parts, or maybe perhaps in more parts, driven by the love of others and say that, I mean, are you, were you aware of that at the time or have you, if you agree with it, have you became aware of that looking back on it in reflection? Oh, well, well I, t- I totally agree with it and I mean again, it's, 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 his name can be bandied about Che Guevara but he talks about that, the, you know, you don't struggle out of, out of hatred, you, you struggle for the love of your people and the community. And I think it was a period during the blanket I learned to hate for the first first of my life, and it was the pettiness, pettiness more than the brutality. Brutality, yeah, was there constant, but and the abuse of power, and and became me particularly aware of men and the abuse of power because he's aware of men. Yeah, and there are people who are nobody's outside. I mean, if you were to shout at them, they'd jump out of their skin. But now they're in a situation where they could strut about and the click of the heels and the cap down and they could just go in and beat you up and they could take your food and throw it out. And just observing that, like I, I remember I did get to just like hate. And then you realise, thankfully that that, that that doesn't that's not doing him any harm, you know, it's only doing me harm if you're yeah, so I don't have any hate and bitterness. You no know, people said, you're not bitter but I say no because really in the sense it did me a favour. It made me think about how how should you behave in the world. I remember ironically my father who never probably read much at all, and I don't say it in any disrespectful way to him, but he had a simple saying, a uh, simple philosophy. If you can't do someone a good turn, at least you never do them a bad one. And, and I've often thought, if you narrow it down to, how, how do I feel if somebody's doing that to me? I feel bad, whether it's brutal or whether it's verbal or whether it's somewhere else, then don't do that to someone else. Like, it's very simple, we know how we want to be treated, yeah. so if we just do that, so I think I, did, I was aware of it to some degree then, but 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 certainly in later years, and and then delighted and very proud of the fact that in the Republican wings, post eighty one, we had a, a situation in play where, and we ended up in control of the wings. So there's forty of us in the wing with shoes and everything on mm-hmm. us, and there's there's four screws at the top of the wing. Like we could go easily and, and batter them, but why, why would you why would you do that? Just and mm-hmm. and and the, and the really important thing, and I wrote a chapter in Phil Scruton's book about this here. I call it the twenty fifth of September when the IRA took over H7 for the escape. And there was one of the screws there, if you're thinking of the five worst, consistently worst screws during the blanket protest, he was there. And there's none stopping the IRA, put him against the wall and execute him. And no one 
got everything charged because nobody would have known, but they didn't because it's an escape, it's not about revenge, it's not about... I want to return to that thing. Uh, you're writing in prison, you're studying in prison, you're released from prison. You're <coughs> around this period, you're, you're looking at ways of expressing who you are, mm. expressing your experience, expressing that... You see, I have to tell you, if your life was put into a film, nobody would go to watch it because it just would be so preposterous. So you're I didn't out. want to say so banal. No, 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 no. <laughs> so you're out, you're out of prison. Um, you get involved in the foundation of the Belfast Film Festival. So the idea behind it is, you explain it better than me, what, is, what was the motivation behind the Belfast Film Festival? It was really, um, we were, me and Brian were starting to write H3, the feature film about, about the hunger strike at the time, and um, I was doing some work with Fela and enjoying Fela at the time, and my former partner Deirdre had been the director of it. And so uh, we're th thinking that the, the only thing missing from Fela is um, the film element, film festival element. So I tied in with Katrina and all the rest of it, and uh, she said, well, go ahead. And uh, no idea about running the film festival, still no idea, like I'm still on the board of the film festival, but I leave that to others who are the experts in film. But I put an advert in the Anytown News, says anybody know how to run a film festival? Because we'll get the back of A woman who lived in Town was the sister of Anya Halloran, who worked for yeah. the Dublin Film Festival. Yeah. Anya got in touch with me. Long story short, as I walked down to Barrow McCrory's office one day and said, would you sign these papers to set up the West Belfast Film Festival? And the really interesting <coughs> thing was a couple of years ago, now it's the Belfast Film Festival, we showed um, a number of screenings down in the High Court. And Barra introduced them. You know, there are films about obviously court scene yeah. and all the rest of it. And he says, I remember the day Lawrence McHugh walked into the office and asked me to sign the, the papers. For it. And it was more because it wasn't... And then you realise, okay, fail it in August and there's so much going on, it's not really the time to be sitting in the cinema. <laughs> so, so we moved it out of fail until the latter part of the year, November. And then it got bigger and bigger. And then I ended up, I was doing my studies at the time, uh, I ended up being employed with Question and Air Kimmy, next prisoners group in yeah. 88. And I didn't have as much time, but I was... I mean, and then it was, I mean, I did the funding, I picked up the guests, I did the, put up the posters. Uh, so I decided to either go back to something very small or to extend it to become city-wide and thankfully we made the right decision and it's going. I remember meeting Stephen Fry, the actor, mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. and it was in the Kennedy Centre. Yeah. He was here as part of the Belfast Film Festival and, his, and his, I remember... His foot got stuck on the, on the tune gun coming out. That's right. But I remember saying, this is a former IRA man, a former hunger striker man that nearly died and he's with the most surreal English, epitome of English upper class and uh, this, is, this, is, this is an admin, we're in yeah. the Kennedy Centre. Yeah. But it worked, you had a very good relationship. Well, and, and, and uh, a really funny story, Jerry, Jerry Adams always opened the, the film festival for us. Stephen had gone over to the Gravedigger's pub. Yeah. Uh, we had to go over to get him out, and of course everybody's trying to hold on to him, and he's coming by and he's waving up at the cameras, security cameras, and he's down <laughs> barracks. And he's thinking he's having a ball of a time. He meets Jerry as Jerry's coming out. He's alone, he's very polite, and all the rest of it. And then Stephen turns to me and he says, That's not really Jerry's shirt, it's not. That's, that's a standard. <laughs> says, no, no, that's him. No, that's him. He says, He just walks about here. I says, Yeah, because he lives, he lives here, you know. But uh, when he was leaving, no, he did, he did his piece and then he had to go straight to Dublin for, uh, I think it was probably the late, late show on RT at the time. What he said was, if I can ever do anything for you, you know, let me know, it's, this has been absolute, you know, a, a wonderful. But that, that, that effect is what you have on people, I have to say. You just seem to get people to do things and, and help out and all of that. Film festival, you're still studying, you go back to Queen's, you become a PhD, you, you, you could, if you wish, you could be, call yourself Dr. McKeown, but you don't. You don't. No. So that Randallstown sense of modesty prevails. I might have used it at a couple of checkpoints, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to say, right, right in a couple of checks? Right in a couple of checks. You mentioned, and I want to talk to you about this, but you mentioned Brian Campbell died, mm. and it must have been very difficult for you because, I mean... Uh, the best of friends, an inspiration to each other, a kind of a, a bouncing off uh, ideas from each other. Uh, what did you do? Just, I mean, I'm going to pick myself up, I'm going to keep on writing, I'm, it's, it's not going to deter me. 
Yeah, well, yeah, there, there, there was all of that. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, me and Brian were about to start to, 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 to write an or play. Uh, I'd spotted him that morning. He was out doing a bit of training. Brian, he was training to do a half marathon. And uh, of course, knowing Brian, it wasn't going to be a half mar marathon in Ireland. It was going to be in Italy somewhere, you know. They had it all planned. And so it was just it was sudden, no. Uh, yeah, it was a massive, massive blow. Um, but I did, and it's, it's, it's probably him today. I still hear us. We, hear his voice when you talk about you hear voices you know i'm sitting down to write something and and people just say well how, how could two years write the same thing like the one do this nor do that and I say, not really i mean if any maybe brian was more into structure i was more into dialogue but but that was that overlapped so i suppose even even um even today when i sit down to write anything you know i'm doing it you know you can hear a voice saying, come on here orange that's that's <laughs> that doesn't that's, work that's not gonna work you know um but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I still miss him today, but it, 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 um, but we had that great, on, 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 a, on a creative sense, we just sort of knew that there. Now, Brian was into other things, like football and all that, he wouldn't be into mm. other friends, but on the, on the creative side was, was, um, was really great. And our politics in terms of, of, of the arts and news and art and politics, I mean, and I think that's what I've tried to do through it, is to use the arts in a way to raise issues, and I think particularly over the last 10 years, it has been through the arts, ironically, because Bobby Sands wrote about the men of arts have lost yeah. their hearts. Um, I mean, whenever I got out of jail, Sinn Féin was in a very different position from when I went in, like whenever I went in, they didn't even take part in elections. You know, now they're in councils, they're prisoners there, they're in control councils. Big strides there, but for me, and I've written about this um, in, in the reprint of Norm Meeting's Serve My Time, that the places where Republicanism was still absent was three areas, the media, the arts and academia. Um, and the reason I ended up doing a PhD wasn't for a qualification. I was looking to write a book about the change in the Republican prisoners from the early 70s, so a very conservative sort of Catholic, hierarchical, militaristic sort of format in, in, in the jails to what became you know, a much more socialist, progressive, and communist. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the IRA went into the background and did what the IRA should be doing, like escapes and all the rest. It didn't have to tell people what programs are watching on TV or whatever. So I wanted to, to do that. It was Mike Tomlinson who was talking to down in Madden's Bar where all the good ideas come all from. All the best ideas. Oh, well, you're good, uh, but you've got to jot them down. Oh, yeah. quickly, you know? He says, well, why don't you do a PhD and then you have a, you have a qualification? And just to go back to him, and I don't, I mean, the, the, the qualification has, has never been on any of me, but there have been places where I've spoken to people have asked, how do you want to be introduced? And I would say, um, former Republican prisoner, Dr. Ronald McEwen, because it subverts mm. the image. Yeah. How can you be a Republican prisoner and be a doctor? You know, yeah. um, and that's really the only, only reason. But for me, it was important to record that time because I think it was a significant change over those years and how did that change come about in a much more communal, collective, progressive politics. I want to mention H3 and then I want to move off to other plays you've written. And I'm very, I'm very conscious of the fact that, that prison life is a very important part and prison memories is a very important part of your life, but it, but your life is so, the sum total is much more than that. And I absolutely agree in terms of academia where Republicans uh, and working class people need to assert mm -hmm. themselves. But and it's changing now. That, that it is changing very much. So H3, not the mechanics of it, was it hard for you to produce history, to, to write history? Was it hard to revisit all of that? Uh, no, not not particularly hard to to, to revisit. Hard to um, <laughs> hard to actually write it because neither Brian or me had ever written a, a script. And it's a really funny story. We, we we it took seven years from we started it till it was finally made in two thousand and one, which is great. It was the twentieth anniversary. Um, and I suppose we were trying to include everything in it, you know, the prisoners, the IRA, the Northern Ireland office, the families, all, all, all the rest of it. And we got this award to go to what was called Moonstone. It was like a subsidiary of Sundance and, and they would hold these writing workshops for a week. And we went to the Isle Sky and it was a, a fantastic experience. We were there for a week and people like Ronan Bennett, who's a yeah. former prisoner, was yeah, there. Yeah. But Carrie Cooley, who wrote Thelma Louise, was there, a wonderful woman and great, great advice. And she had, she actually told us she had that script in her head for about two years. And she never went near a computer. When she did, she wrote it in three weeks, and it was more or less filmed the way it was. But anyway, we went with uh, a script that was 100 pages, and usually a, a page is equal to a minute, so we thought, there's, there's, you know, 100 minutes, that's more or less the length of the film. We're pretty, pretty happy with it. And um, I remember sitting talking to Ronan Bennett, and he says, you have too many monkeys on your shoulder. You're trying to get everybody's story in. 
tell the story you know, which is the prisoner's story. And we left there the sky and we deleted 73 of the 100 pages. <laughs> and I guess it was painful. I could remember the night sitting up in Bali. <laughs> like putting the children up for adoption. Right, it, it adopted the, the attic. Transfer. So you can remember the night you sat writing that wonderful, wonderful act, you know. And then uh, it's gone. But then, but yeah, and actually once that one, I'd really, we agonised, but, but, but we knew it was the right thing, and we were been told that by, by others as well, and that actually helped. But still, it took between between writing it and trying to get the money, because thinking back to that time, I mean, the film would never have been made without James Flynn and Juanita Wilson, the producers. To take on that project at that time, I mean, the South can still be very hostile to oh, Republicans. Absolutely. If you're thinking around until, you know, the, the latter part of the 1990s, like, nobody wanted to give money to a film written by two, two guys from the IRA who are still very proud of the fact and yeah. very much connected with the Republican movement. Uh, so it was not difficult to revisit. Um, well, I'm saying that, I mean, what I did find difficult, 20th anniversary, and it's, it's, it's funny now you think of back, like prior to the 20th anniversary, there wasn't, yeah, there was a fence to mark Hunger Strikers Day, and usually locally not, but there wasn't a big national thing. Yeah. I don't know, I said the White Line Packet, there was the Bobby Sands Memorial Lecture up in the Kilwee in Twinbrook. Uh, the 20th, probably because it was now post Good Friday and people are reflecting back, and I think it's only after conflict that you then really realise the extent of the grief and the loss and all the rest of it. So there's more of an emphasis on it. And I started to go around the country, uh, getting asked by different people from, from Kerry to the Derry and, and all around. And, uh, I didn't realise that at the time, and it was a later year, and it was a, a friend of mine said to me, in the Basque country, a woman, she picked up on it, just on, on writing a letter, of, of how I'd become really morbid, and that's not, that's not me. No, oh, And I think what it was, was, well my, my understanding was that several nights a week I was reliving yeah. Reliving, and people yeah. asking, what was this, and what yeah. was your mother yeah. like, and how do you feel that, and, how do you, and you're going, yeah, it says here, uh, and then sometimes you just, you know, an image comes in your head next minute, you break down in tears, and then you go back to it again, and, and, and that, that still happens to me today. Um, so I, I do think there is a thing of, 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 of repeating and repeating and repeating, and, and uh, yeah, and I've written about the past and talked about it and all the rest of it. I don't live in it at all. I live very much, I, I love that book, um, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, which is, mm. is now, this is the only moment we have. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. So remember the past, don't ever try don't to be a captive hate it, moment. but don't, don't, don't be captive to it. Which brings me to another, another stage of your life. Um, and forgive me for not being able to remember the name. Right. I, I had it in my head until we started talking and you've taken my head to other <laughs> places altogether. But one of the plays that you, you wrote um, was of the, the advice worker who becomes friendly with the widow of a former policeman. And don't, don't answer the question until I, until I have it constructed in my head. And you talked earlier about, at one stage, your resistance was nearly based upon defiance of the person or, or the monster at the door mm -hmm. or, or whatever it may be. But that play, and I've seen it a number of times, first of all, you need to remind me of the name of the play. Yeah. Uh, but that play uh, it presents the opposite. It presents all the combatants from the, the widow's, the widow to, the, to her dead husband to his mother, to the advice worker, to his brother, it presents everybody as a victim of conflict. So, was that a growing up? Was that a moving on from what had been in your head, or, or was how deliberate was that? Well, I think it was. I mean, I like to think that um, all the the plays that I've been involved in, and me and Brian, but obviously a few that um, the last thing you ever want to do is propaganda. I mean, first of all, it's boring. boring. Um, so even whenever we wrote um, The Laughter of Our Children, which was for the 20th anniversary, yeah. we showed how the Hunger Strike divided families, divided communities, divided the GAA. It wasn't this everybody all together, you know, everybody was grappling, yeah. regardless of what decision you took, it's, it's a real life issue. Um, and I think the other thing is once you have sort of affirmed the, the Republican position, which I think we did through all the productions we did, it's then an interesting to find out about wh where others are, but and also what the time is. And one of the first ones we did, me and Brian, was a cold house, which was a conversation between an RUC man and a, an ex prisoner, which didn't go down well in, in, in White Rope because people at that time in, weren't was, ready for it, weren't, weren't ready for it. Yeah, but we're more or less saying if we're taught this was like 
2003, so we're five years after the, the Good Friday Agreement, but this is what, things are now, naturally you talked about RVC men or whatever else, yeah. at the time wasn't, but when I came to that there, so it's more about the film, that, or the play is called uh, Those You Pass on the Street. Um, so yes, by that stage, I had a lot of interaction with other people who, you know, one time I would have thought everybody who joined the RUC uh, did sort of smash Finian skulls, and then you realise, not necessarily the case. Yeah, there yeah. may have been some did that, but for others growing up in that community, their father was in it, their grandfather was, you know, they have a history in the, in the, in the union's community of service, they call it, in, in services. But what prompted it was, um, a guy in the Sinn Féin Centre sent me one day, um, he says, Lawrence, there was a, a woman coming here. I don't know if he told me th 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 with the idea of, of it being a play. He says, come in here and ask for help with uh, antisocial behaviour. He says, yeah, he says, and I knew she was a bit of an RUC man, and I read killed. And, uh, and he, of course, he, he sorted the whole issue for her, uh, as, he, as, as he would, lovely, lovely guy. Uh, but it just, uh, just intrigued that she did it. And it intrigued me and it stayed with me until I had an opportunity to write something about how, how do people come together, victims, survivors, and all the rest of it. Um, and ended up writing that to show the complexity and interweaving um, of, of people's lives, like, like what prompted her to do that. It was a bit hard then moving on to a new stage. And what I try to bring out is even though she's, you know, you could say the, the fictional in it, actually, when the guy tries to sympathise with her at one time and I don't know how you feel and she says, no, no, you don't. And I yeah. hear that when people, you discover by then in the play that... Yeah, he does because he's a... I don't want yeah. to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just saying, I'm not saying the whole story. So yeah. it was more... Because just to... And, and the other thing was to say that if you're going to engage in dealing with the past, then you're going to cause conflict inside families, inside communities, as you know. Mm. I mean, trying yeah. to put on people have different, different, different opinions, but... It is important that you deal with the past, or, or, or at least raise it and be aware of, of, of that complexity of things. And it's not that we are the ones who suffered everything and totally else didn't. And you know, it's uh, and also showing how I mean, we debated at the end of it for, for days how we would end it because you can't. I, I don't ever like to have these neat all this everything tied up and uh, everybody lives yeah. happily ever after. No, yeah. they don't. That's just this is now the start of more yeah. upheaval. But for me, probably, it's always been a case of it's amazing if you can have the human contact because I've had meetings with people uh, who started identifying themselves as I'm so and so, victim of your murders campaign. Not the second or third meeting, it's first name terms and you're sharing yeah. phone numbers. And yeah. it's, it's amazing if, if the human contact, and it's also amazing if you can have a cup of tea with someone or yeah, a yeah. meal. Yeah. It somehow changes. I had a, and another world. Uh, I had a, a, an interesting conversation with a woman whose father was a prison warder, a screw, in the blocks. And she described her father uh, as been terrified of the prisoners on the other side of the door because they were too smart, too cute, and they couldn't be broken. So you have an example of the other thing. <coughs> Can I ask you, we're, we're almost out of time when we've covered prison. We've covered your doctorate. We've covered um, the two guards. What, what do your daughters do, if you don't mind me asking? Quillen is in the filmmaking. She did her degree at Queen's uh, and finished two and a half years ago and has been in employment since. And in fact, she's got a new contract to go Good to. So I'm delighted. And she's, yeah, she's the type of maker. And I've always said, if you're in that industry and you have the skill, but you also have the, the, the social skills and manner, if people can see that you're Prepare to chip in. You know, you're, there's no room for um, prima donnas. You know, maybe actors, but anybody else. <laughs> you need to be there at six in the morning. There Saturday <coughs> night. And my other daughter is studying human rights at uh, Galway. She's in her last year, and and she's also into. I was down helping her last week make a short documentary. So she's she's into cameras and film as well. You, you know the whack, the the Mac and quotation about taking the man from the bog and not the bog and the man and all of that. Are you still a Randallstown boy? I still, I'm not so much around this town, my, my sister still lives there and I go down, but I'm, I'm still very much uh, rural. I love to be out in, in nature, I love to be in the, the forest, uh, walking Ravensdale Forest or Slee Gullion uh, or by the sea. So I think there's, there's something other about the rural, but I love, I love the city life as well and the vibrancy. So I think there's a way to blend the two that you get, uh, get everything. Same as having like in my own company, but also like in other people's company. Have you plans for the future? You can give exposures here, you can tell us uh, 
about the blockbuster you're writing? Uh, I wouldn't say blockbuster. Yeah, I'm still still writing. I'm uh, at the moment. I'm working on a, a project I did years ago called Aftermath, which was a voices of a whole mixture. Of people are very diverse, and I've always wanted to turn it into a an educational resource, not just for young people, but for for anyone. Uh, and thankfully, and I and I have that funding for it, so I'm producing that. And I wrote a play as 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 part of it. Before you go, and um, I'm hoping to develop a another play at the minute and discussion with ones about um, what a new All Ireland Constitution would look like and what are the fears that people have that stop them, particularly from a more Northern Unionist point of view. But to do it as a as a play, I, I suppose we've just we've kind of skidded and skimmed over over a life well lived. I have to say, from from. Boy in Ronaldstown, the prisoner, the, all that stuff, and successful playwright and scriptwriter and all of that, and successful father and the whole, the whole lot. Is there something that, that, and apart from work, is there any other aspect of your life that you would like to kind of complete or that you would take a run at? Do you, know, do you want to learn to sing or to play a guitar or anything? Uh, I would love to play the guitar. I mean, I'm very, very, very jealous of people who have a singing voice. I think it's amazing you just entertain your, yourself with it. Um, it's not specific, but I do always like um, a challenge or a project. I suppose what I would really like, um, and maybe think of this particular because I was with someone yesterday who's an ex-prisoner who, who works in sculpting and all the rest, and he lives in this lovely place out in the country, has his own workshop. Uh, I would like to get into something out there like um, sculpting or working with would have found it very, very satisfying to, to create something out of um, yeah, out of out of something that's yeah, if out. you're ever looking at a male model I'm, I'm, <laughs> you're, you're I'm available. available. You're available <laughs> Don't know why it'll help sell any of it. If this new adventure that you're plotting and it's rattling around your head is as successful as all your others, we no doubt be back here talking about your successful show. Uh, mm -hmm. wherever it may be. So Lawrence, or Larnie, however, thank you. you you've been entertaining and, and insane. Gordon Mead Melgan, thank Good you. Melbourne,